uh, in Denmark, we are often uh, at the top of you know the happiness scale, and one of the explanation is that we have very low expectations. So, with the introduction you gave here, I think you gave me a difficult start because you are too too kind. But uh, it's a it's a big honor to to be back in the seminar series, and uh, unfortunately, uh, only on Zoom. But uh, uh, I'm I'm very happy to to tell you a little bit about longevity in rich families and uh, trying to figure out how they succeeded uh, with a background as a medical doctor. It is um, it is the usual starting point uh, for a medical doctor is in in persons or families where something went wrong and then you as a medical doctor come in. In public health, we come in earlier in the prevention and so on. But I think really it has been a privilege to be in a study that kind of look at the exceptional uh, survivors, those with the best health and so on. It, it has a, already a positive note uh, uh, to the study when you contact people and want to include them because they're exceptionally good in terms of health and survival. Uh, so, so that has been very enjoyable, also working in this field as a, uh, a, an MD. And what I'm going to tell you about is part of uh, the long life family study, uh, which started out, uh, I think 18 years ago as a U01 uh, from the National Institute of Aging that is where the uh, National Institute of Aging put together uh, a team of various research group to, to study a specific uh, topic, and in this case, long-lived families. And this has later been uh, converted to what's called a U19 funding mechanism. And it has... Uh, the Data Management Coordinating Center in, in the, at WashU. And then it has uh, four data collection sites, uh, uh, Boston, Columbia, Pittsburgh, and, and, and Denmark, and then a uh, demographic center at Duke. And the, the basic study design is that it, we are on the outlook for pedigrees with extreme familial longevity. And uh, we developed a metric to score families for their potential value to a study of familial longevity. And as you see here, it's, it's a, a group of long lived siblings and uh, the score they get, it's based on the exceptionality of ages at death or the exceptionality exceptionality of expected ages of death, plus a bonus for living siblings in order to be informative in the study. But just to give you a flavor of the minimum uh, exceptionality, it's typically that there should be at least two siblings more than 90. But this kind of the lower end uh, for qualifying. Uh, our more showcase families is like these six sisters at a hundred year birthday. Together, they came very close to six hundred years uh, uh, of life together, and, and uh, there's quite a lot of these families in the long life family study from these four data collection sites. Uh, All together, it's about five thousand individual from about. 502 generational families, so it's about nine average family size. And to be included, there should be at least a living SIP pair in the upper generation, both participating. So all the selection of these families is in the upper generation, and that's very important to keep in mind. And also, to we work uh, closely with Framingham Heart Study because they are also a multi-generational uh, study. And when we compare the Framingham families to our families, less than 1% of the Framingham study, uh, families would meet the criteria to come into the long-life family study. 
we have followed these. The first visit was in the time period 2006 to nine, and then there was a visit two after eight to 10 years. <clears throat> we have many publications showing a healthier aging profile in the, these two generations. It's not very surprising in the other one uh, because they were selected for it, but uh, it was not given that also their children should have a healthier aging profile. But there's still between the families considerably uh, phenotypic and familial heterogeneity. And some of the families are really big. Uh, we have uh, families with more than 70 participants just from, from the two generations. And now we are also starting to include grandchildren in the study. And just to, to, to give you an overview of the generation included, there's kind of a generation zero. These are born in the late uh, 19th century and are dead at the, in the beginning of the uh, uh, 21st century when we started the study. So those that we are including are zip ships like this one, born in the beginning of the 20th century, spouses and as controls, and then their offspring, which are typically born in the middle of the 20th century, as well as their spouses as controls. And for reasons that I'll tell you about today, we also decided to start including the grandchildren who are born uh, around uh, the, the turn of the millennium. But we're not including all of the grandchildren because that would be way too many. And actually, we have an ongoing data collection now of visit three, including grandchildren. And uh, we had our kickoff meeting in Washington, D.C. for starting the data collection in the first week of March 2020. So you can imagine how that went afterwards. Uh, three days after uh, uh, I came back, uh, uh, Europe more or less closed down. And so it has been a bumpy uh, one and a half year doing data collection in the field. And I know you, some of you have similar experience trying to navigate this. But it is ongoing, and we are expecting here in Visit 3 to have about uh, 400 in the upper generation, about 2,000 in the offspring generation, and then include about 800 grandchildren from those families that has shown to be genetically most informative. That is typically already very large families with linkage peaks indicating uh, genetic factors influencing these uh, healthy aging uh, phenotypes. So this is the ongoing uh, study. But what I'm going to focus on today is actually what you call a spin-off project of the work that we did in order to identify uh, the SIP the SIPs included uh, from Denmark. And Denmark is uh, this uh, uh, small peninsula and a, a few islands here north of uh, Germany. It's about 6 million people. And uh, it has had basically a very uneventful history in many ways. Uh, didn't suffer much under the, the world wars compared to uh, many other countries in, in Europe. And it has a long tradition for, for careful registration and for national registers and for a, a centralized healthcare system. And this is things that make it very uh, easy to be epidemiologist in Denmark to compare to many other countries outside the Nordic. And the way we identified these long-lived siblings was combining national registration system and church book. And this way we identified about 650 families that had extreme longevity and we interviewed these uh, families. 
and 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 uh, uh, had their pedigrees uh, drawn. And you can see they're born here in the beginning of the 20th century. And from these, we got information on the about 5,000 offspring. And then, then we are up in modern time, and then we can find the grandchildren through registers, which is a much easier task. So we can find about the 10,000 offspring. For the in-person part of the long life family study, we selected uh, about 10% of these families to, uh, to reach the number that we uh, should include from Denmark. But we were thinking, why not use the, the remaining 90% as well in, in the register studies that are possible in, in Denmark to learn from this bigger sample that could complement the in-person part of the long life family study. And the register system in Denmark goes back quite, quite a, a while. For instance, the Danish cancer register has had systematic re registration since the 1940s. The civil and social registration system started in 1968. And this is central to all our studies because we are able to link our survey data with the, the civil and social registration system. And we also have access to a 5% random sample of the whole population. So from this, we can uh, randomly choose eight and six matched controls uh, in, in our studies of our uh, long lived family members. Cause of death registers, uh, are back to 68, the patient, the national patient register from 77, education register from 80, and a prescription register is uh, from 1995. And these are the ones that we take advantage of when we do the study of all those we identified uh, in connection with, with the study. But back to the SIP ship. Uh, who are the, uh, the, the pro bands of, of this study. And uh, the six sisters here, they look like this in 1920. And of course, when you, you, you see this, then one of the first thoughts you could have is, is what we're studying just really socioeconomic status? Are we studying the most privileged? Also because if we are selecting on big ship ships living a long time, you also select on stable families. It takes time to make a big family uh, with full ships. So it means that these children grew up in a non-broken family or it, it was not broken early on at least. And in order to, to test whether they we, we were just studying, uh, or just, but whether we, the mechanism was that we were studying children who had a good start in life. We were looking into the possibility, how could we compare these families that we knew to uh, the background population and control uh, families? And here we use the fact that we knew the offspring spouses and the, uh, their families, so we could go backwards and identify the grandparents of the spouse control to see whether they differed from uh, the proband's uh, parents. And furthermore, we were so lucky that uh, we could look more into this from, from the case stories, of course. And here, when we looked into uh, the spouse controls, grandparent then once in a while there was a lone mother and that's of uh, you know with with one child and that of course was not in the long-lived ship uh, ship uh, family so there were some differences but actually the number of children uh, in the long-lived family it was seven point something while in the control family it was six point something so there was a small tendency for bigger families in the long-lived Ship ships, which could also be expected because then you have 
more chances that at least two lived a, a long time. But, but the difference was not marked. And then we had the advantage of a census that was made in 1916. At that time, Denmark was only half the size of today with about 3 million people. And what was unusual for this census was that it didn't only include occupation, but it's one of the few that also included income and assets and taxes for municipality and state. And we were able to go back to these censuses and identify our longevity and rich families. So how did these SIPSIP grew up in terms of socioeconomic status? and compare them to the control families and the background population. And there was, there was some uh, differences, but they were for sure not marked. Uh, and they, they had a slight edge in socioeconomic status, but as you can see to the left, that is the overall country. This is the longevity in rich families, and this is the control, and you can see the big part is agriculture, fishery and forestry, and uh, craft and industry. Uh, slight advantage in intellectual property, uh, but the differences are, are modest. So it doesn't look like we are just studying uh, the rich. And we also, as I'll show you later, uh, made comparison in, in the offspring generation. And then when we look at these long-lived siblings, then uh, the first one, and they are selected for being able to participate in the study and giving consent and so on. So this is not very surprising that they uh, are uh, among the best in their birth cohort. But what we were also interested in was that uh, long-lived siblings better than what you could call sporadic long-lived individuals, where there was a, a, a long-lived individuals with no long-lived uh, siblings. That, uh, and you could, you could think that chains could play a bigger role in sporadic long-livers than in long-lived siblings. And indeed, we, when we looked at, uh, say, a woman aged 93 from a long-lived sibling family, and compared her to a sporadic 93 years old and did that for all of them and went back in the register uh, from age 65 to 93 or whatever age they, they had, then we could see that there was a history of fewer hypertensive diseases, fewer cerebrovascular diseases and less depression. And if we were looking onwards, then they had a significant better survival than the sporadic ones. And then we moved on to, to look at the offsprings. And here it's important, they are not selected on having good health or any survival. Then they can die early on. Then we'll know of them by reporting from their parents that they die early on. So the only card they have on hand is that they have a long-lived parent who also have a sibling living a long time. That's all. That's all the advantage they have. And the first we looked at here, that was the overall cancer incidence in offspring of the Danish long-lived siblings. And based on the, the follow-up time and the national numbers, with the observation time that we had, one would expect about 545 cases of cancer, but we observed only 423. That means that the cancer occurrence was 22% less than expected. Then the next step was to see, okay, is there a specific type of cancer that is, that is missing uh, to give us a hint about uh, the mechanism? And then when we looked at the overall, that was the 22% reduction. Breast, there was a tendency, it was not significant. Colon, a tendency, it was not significant. And then lung cancer, 
we only saw a third of the cases we would expect. We would have expected 71, but observed 24. And if we took the more broadly defined group of tobacco related, then it was reduced by one third. That suggests that uh, the longevity in rich uh, families smoke less than the background population, or it could also be that they were more resilient towards the uh, harmful effect of smoking. But here it comes in so nicely that we also have the in-person part of the long life family. And here we could see indeed they have lower sm smoking frequency than the background population. And then we also looked at survival, uh, both in the offspring and the spouses. And with the observation time and the birth year for these uh, offspring and spouses, where we have statistical power is in the age range 20 to 70. And here we observed about 500 deaths in both group. And what we could see was that these children had only about half the uh, mortality compared to the background population. So that is a huge difference based on this just having a long-lived family, uh, uh, parents and uh, who also have a sibling living a long time. What was real, oh, sorry, what was really interesting was that the spouses also had considerably less mortality, not as big as the offspring, where the reduction was one half, but in the spouse, it, it, it was one third. And the mechanism here could, of course, be a sort of mating, uh, healthy, uh, with good lifestyle, happy offspring, married uh, spouse with similar profile. Or it could be a kind of spillover effect uh, uh, to the spouses from uh, the offspring. And seeing these patterns, we were thinking, okay, if we see so big effect in the offspring, Maybe we can also detect some advantage in the grandchildren generation. Although one could say all what they have on hand is that they could say, I have a grandparent living a long time who also have a sibling living a long time. And then I think most people would think, oh, good for you. And then silently think that that couldn't probably uh, make any significant difference in, in any way to these uh, grandchildren that they had a grandparent with these characteristics. But we had a first uh, uh, a look at this uh, in a rough way to compare infant and child mortality in the grandchildren of longevity and rich families versus matched children. And here, the solid line here, you can see is the longevity at risk uh, grandchildren and the other ones are uh, the background population stratified whether born in Denmark or uh, those outside uh, Denmark are born. This is on, on the parents' side. And you can see there is a significant difference. You should please notice the scale. We are uh, talking about very low mortality, but still with significant differences. And then we also had a first uh, uh, look at the time to hospitalization and uh, we saw the same pattern again the time uh, to first hospitalization after the hospitalization in connection with birth was significantly longer in longevity and rich uh, grandchildren so it looked like this was tracking all the way down so then we decided to to kind of make a major study with all the registers to try to identify whether it was specific diseases that were missing, like we were missing the lung cancer um, uh, in, in, in the cancer study, then to have a more general picture in order to try to understand the mechanism better. And it came out remarkable. We took these about 5,000 offsprings uh, that we had a follow-up time of several thousand, uh, uh, 100,000 person years. And then we selected close to 10 controls for each of those matched on 
uh, uh, birth year and sex. And here we have more than a million uh, person year follow up. Then we divided all diseases and disorders into 23 groups. And uh, this is hospital discharge diagnosis. Uh, and then it, it, they are all included in, in one of these 23 groups. Then we had a black line that shows the hazard ratio unadjusted for educational attainment at age 30, and then a red one with adjusted for educational attainment at age 30. If the hazard ratio were one, then there was no difference between the longevity enriched offspring and the match controls. But you can see the virtually all of the disease group are below the line and far the majority significantly so. And if we look at it from the biggest effect, then we can see that mental disorders uh, is the most pronounced one where the risk is cut close to half. So this showed that the, the offspring of longevity enriched uh, siblings had an advantage more or less across the board of the disease groups. And if we looked into cause specific mortality to see what did these die from? And I forgot to say that here, where we have the power is again between 20 and 70. That is where we have the follow up time in the offspring generation. And again, cause of death here. So it's it's pretty early death. And here you can see the, the any cause, and that is the, the mortality that is about half the background population. But again, we can see that these causes of death are across the, the, the board of uh, uh, various uh, causes of death. And then if we move on to uh, grandchildren, and here the observation time is from birth to to about 50, and again with uh, adjustment. And just going back here and see the red and the black line don't differ much. We can see having a better education give you a slight edge, but it's not much. So this is not driven by socioeconomic status. Uh, that, that only removes a little bit of the effect. But back to the grandchildren and their disease incidence, and it's in the age group from birth to 50. And now you can see it's again mental and behavioral disorders that has the biggest reduction. But you can also see that the reduction is not half, but it's uh, a quarter. So it is, it is a, a quite different level. It's, it's about half. We have quite some statistical power with hundreds of thousand person year follow up in the grandchildren and millions in the controls. And that is also necessary because it is luckily a, a, quite rare to get hospitalized in these age group for, for non uh, birth related uh, conditions. And again, with the uh, cause specific mortality, you can see again, it's about half the effect size in the grandchildren uh, generation compared to the offspring. And again, across all the different causes of death. And so we can see that the, 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 both the offspring and the grandchildren are less uh, likely to get diseases. They're more robust. But then we also try to say, okay, if they get the diseases, how, are they also more resilient? Do they have a better survival? And here we looked at survival after cancer diagnosis. And we had about 600 individuals who died during the 15 years follow-up after cancer diagnosis. Here we had about uh, 500 offspring and about twice the number of controls. And we can see that, yes, the uh, offspring of long-lived sibling had significantly better survival. So they are not only more robust, they were also more resilient. 
Then we also had a look into more behavioral related phenotypes. The thing with these register, the good thing is that they cover everybody. They, they have close to complete follow-up. No, uh, but the degree of behavioral uh, component is hard to estimate because there's no uh, kind of traditional survey information like smoking exercise and so what we tried to look at was uh, demographic outcomes uh, that was uh, related to behavior. And here, uh, teenage parenthood and divorce. And again, the longevity and rich family offspring and uh, grandchildren had a, a, a profile that was different than the background population in terms of lower occurrence of teenage parenthood and less uh, risk of divorce. So to sum it up, uh, both the offspring and grandchildren had better survival than the background population, have lower occurrence of virtually all disease groups. They're more robust. They have better prognosis after disease onset. They're more resilient. And the only advantage is that they're having a long-lived parent or grandparent who had siblings also living a long time. So how did they succeed, you know, to, to answer the question uh, at slide one? At least uh, what we can say about them is that uh, the characteristics are that they are large and stable families, that it's not particular uh, SES associated. There's indication of uh, assortative mating and spillover, low occurrence of virtually all disease group and better survival after cancer and uh, cardiovascular disease. And this, that is its tracking tree generation, clearly shows that familial factors are important. And here, uh, the, the, the good thing is that the mechanism can be studied in the in-person part of the long life family study. And one of the main efforts in the study is to look at genes to test whether there's multiple rare protective variants. And here a combination of the GWAS and the sequencing that has been done or are ongoing in these about 5,000 individuals can be combined to get insight into this. Another uh, area of big interest here is uh, whether this is driven by epigenetic mechanisms. But we also, I think, have to keep in, in focus the behavior because all these characteristics of the families that they are stable with less divorce, less teenage pregnancy, less smoking, and uh, the most marked reduction in disease occurrence was in the mental and behavioral disorders. And so this suggests that, um, that behavior could be a major component probably together with uh, genetic factors and uh, a, a good proportion of good luck uh, on top uh, to make them so exceptional, these, these families. And it's important to keep in mind that behavior both have the environmentally and genetically influenced components. And just to, to wrap up with uh, what we are doing currently uh, with this resource, that is kind of like a small spin-off of, of the uh, overall U01 and U19, is that right now we are updating the register linkage in Statistic Denmark from 2013 to 2021. And what we are interested in here is also to look at end of life and cause of death in the long-lived siblings. What I've presented you up to now has only been the cause of death in, in, in the offspring and, and the grandchildren. And uh, so we know that these siblings are living longer in better health, but are they also leaving the, the planet uh, in a more uh, a desirable way than a sporadic long-lived individuals. That is what we're looking into. And especially whether they have the ability to escape dementia 
to a bigger degree compared to the sporadic long-lived individuals. Also considering the marked reduction in the mental and behavioral uh, disease group. One thing that we are also looking very much into is the mechanism of lower infant mortality in the longevity in rich families. Because at least to us, it was surprising that it was seen already in infant mortality. How can this be explained? And therefore, we want to look more into the, both the infant health and the, 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 the phenotypes measured uh, in connection with birth, but also the maternal health, behavioral and social characteristics. And here it's actually one of the areas where there are more behavioral information in the registers. And then finally, in, in, um, we want to look into SARS and COVID-19 in the longevity in rich families uh, to, to see have all three generations been less affected with the infection and uh, disease compared to uh, match population controls. And also because this is uh, national healthcare, we can also see the testing behavior and the vaccination behavior. Again, to see whether uh, this pattern of being very conscientious about their health and behavior is also part of uh, a potential advantage in connection with the pandemic. And finally, I want to, to thank all uh, the, the members on our team that has played a key role in, in making this happen over nearly uh, two decades. <clears throat> and not least, uh, thanks to the funders, where it's the National Institute on Aging who has been the, the funder of this study, but also uh, the, the European funding sources that has helped us building the, the resource. I want to, to thank them as well. Thank you. <laughs>